Good evening and welcome to our Jigsaw webinar for parents, facilitated by Jigsaw Clinicians. Before we get started, I'll go through a few guidelines. You'll need headphones, earphones or a quiet space. Please close all other applications running in the background of your computer. If you experience any problems with sound or vision, please check your internet connection. However, if you continue to experience difficulties through the webinar, please contact us on elearning at jigsaw.ie or ask a question to our moderator. During the webinar, we would encourage you to ask questions via the control panel. These will be directed to the facilitator and answered at the end of the session. Please note that we cannot hear or see you during the webinar unless you have agreed to become a panelist for the webinar. So how do I ask a question? On your screen, you will see a control panel. You can ask a question at any time through this control panel. After typing your question, press send or the enter key. You can also expand this control panel to full screen mode. Other attendees at the webinar will not see your questions. At the end of the session, please give us your feedback by answering the post-webinar survey. We hope you enjoy the webinar. Yeah. Have I got the right one showing there, Olive? Yeah, I can see it. Great, excellent, sorry. Hi everyone, um, welcome to this evening's webinar on self-care during the winter months. Um, my name is Connor Boxberger, I'm clinical manager with Jigsaw Dublin City and I'm with Dr. Olive Maloney, who is our clinical manager in Jigsaw Kerry. And we're very lucky to be joined by Catherine White, who is our ISL interpreter for this evening. Um, you'll have to forgive me, this is my first webinar, so if the technical uh, glitches happen, it's probably on me. Um, but hopefully not. So we're here this evening because we believe that self-care is important. Um, I suppose not just for ourselves, but also to ensure that we're resourced enough to be those kind of one good adults in the lives of the young people that we care about. We'll be together for about an hour this evening um, and there's going to be plenty of time for questions. So as the video mentioned, please feel free to ask as many questions as you like, pop them into the chat box and we'll get to them. We'll try and get to all of them um, by the time we finish up this evening. What I will say is we might have particular questions regarding you know, the welfare of a young person um, who's in our life. Um, and what I might say is that we might hold those questions and maybe to get in touch with your local Jigsaw service or our free phone number, which operates from Monday to Friday. Um, and all the information for those is on the jigsaw.ie website. So this evening, we're going to look at some of the things that can deplete our well-being, some of the things that can cause us quite a lot of stress or anxiety. We're going to look at how when these things happen, you know, how our body responds and how we might respond in ways that might be less helpful. We're going to go on then to explore some ways um, that we might be able to respond in a different way and, and put some focus on some practical things that we might be able to do to look after our own self-care. Okay. Thanks, Connor. Um, so just to say it is my first time doing this as well. Uh, you'll hopefully forgive us if we um, if we slip a little or make mistakes and I guess part of the emphasis of this evening is being kind to ourselves. So we're trying to do that as well as we're sitting here. Um, so I'm coming to this also a clinical psychologist, a clinical manager and a parent to a one-year-old who's downstairs as we speak. Um, so I know very well in my own life um, as a clinician, you know, the, the busyness that a, a parent's life can involve. So I know that kind of professionally, but I, I know it personally and what that can be like. Um, so we're certainly not suggesting that all that we're juggling is suddenly going to disappear um, when we start to focus more on self-care. But what we are hoping for is that we get a bit clearer um, about how we spend our time, maybe taking a step back, um, thinking about how we can replenish ourselves so that we can go back into the busyness um, and, and, and face it better for ourselves again. So while I do have a one-year-old, I'm not the parent of a teenager. So that's another thing that I have to look forward to in the future. Um, and really, myself and Connor, we don't um, at all intend to patronise or speak down to people. Like We're really hoping that we can draw on your experiences as well as parents in this. So as Connor said, like put questions into the chat box. And if you have resources yourselves that you feel have worked for you, 
um, then please do share those with us and, and we can let everybody else have those after. Um, so give us feedback and let us know whether we've pitched this to the right level. Um, so we don't want to assume too much, but we are assuming that everyone's coming here because you would like to focus a little bit on, on yourself, on, on learning something, taking away something. Something's prompted you to take stock of, of how you look after yourself or how you feel supported in being a parent. Um, so we want to reiterate, I guess, that self-care is not a luxury. Um, we think it's essential. And we would talk to young people about it being essential. We really think it's important that the people around them are also letting them know that by showing them that they take it seriously as well. Um, it doesn't always have to be serious. Of course, it can be fun too. Um, we're also assuming that this um, is something people want to get a bit practical about. So we do have some short exercises towards the end. And some of you will know some of this already. So feel free to take away what you, you would like um, and leave behind what you, what you already do know. So I guess something that we always say to parents at Jigsaw is that we assume that people are doing their best with the resources available to them at any given moment. Um, that doesn't mean that they sometimes might do better, um, but that at that moment in time, that that's what's available to them. Um, so people come to this with their own histories of parenting, of being parented and being in families. Um, we're trying to speak to a group here so we can miss out a little bit on, on how each of us has our own history of being in a family and how we may have been attuned to or not attuned to. We may have had parents modeling self-care to us or not. Um, being validated by people or not um, and so there's lots of external environmental factors that will have come into you know bringing us to where we are as parents as well um, and you know what we've taken away from all of those experiences into our own lives what we're here to say I suppose is we want to acknowledge the importance of you having made the choice to look after yourself to model some of these strategies of self-soothing or caring for yourself for your children and how that will really influence them and um, how you take time out for yourself in the future. It will help them also to look after themselves. Um, so it's finally what we know about parenting is that we need to, to model attunement um, and misattunement and repair things as well when that happens. We need to get it right or be accurate in, in how we understand the young person in our life about a third of the time. We need to be striving to get it right um, and working really hard to get it right a third of the time. And we need to also give ourselves permission to be misattuned or even fail about a third of the time. To get it wrong, to learn from that and to repair. Um, so not just to make a mistake and leave it, um, but actually to look at that and, and support yourself and a young person perhaps to learn from it. And all of that is vital um, for, for modeling. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that people um, have some of those ideas in mind when it comes to this um, idea about self-care because I suppose in Irish society as well traditionally perhaps people um, have thought about self-care or had a belief that it's something um, additional and if we have you know the luxury to do it then we will but actually we, we want to put it front and centre as, as essential. Thanks, Olive. So to get us kind of started, um, I'd like to first kind of get an idea, working from maybe the outside in, of some of the things that might cause stress or anxiety to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I suppose if I went out to the street and asked, you know, a survey of people, what are the types of things that stress them out, I'd probably get a lot of maybe day-to-day -day answers back. Things like finances, things like... Um, you know, family commitments, things like arguments with partners, even things like the day-to-day -day household tasks. Um, it's important to recognize that there's a lot more at play than our kind of day-to-day -day stresses. So this model outlines some of the kind of different levels where we might experience stress. So we see at the bottom here, we have ourselves, our internal world. So it might be thoughts we have about something or perceptions we have might even be feelings we, we have, you know, emotions that are coming up or even physical sensations we might notice in ourselves. And then the next level is those things within our kind of immediate, you know, kind of day to day life, things like issues in our neighborhood or community, maybe parenting, finances, 
family commitments and work. Um, they're things that we regularly kind of think of when we think of things that might stress us out. But there's a broader level as well that sometimes we're aware of and other times we kind of push it to the back of our minds so we don't think too much about it. Things like climate chaos, COVID-19 obviously is a huge piece, you know, or any kind of pandemics, um, structural racism, refugee crises and global politics are all these things that we're hearing about all the time, sometimes just in the background when we're making the tea in the morning and we're hearing it on the news. And we may, maybe don't think about it too much, but it might still be causing this kind of underlying low level of stress. Um, I think a lot of us might be able to connect with that with the COVID crisis. You know, we, we get it by our, our day-to-day -day lives, but then when we stop and think about it, we realize actually just how much stress this is causing us. And I suppose all of these are interconnected. So again, our thoughts and feelings will usually relate to one of these kind of areas or being, you know, they're, they're all interconnected. And what can add to the stress is our sense of control. So usually the further away things are, um, things like climate chaos or, you know, um, refugee crises, we might feel, yeah, I'm really stressed out about it. I'm really, you know, upset about it, but I don't know what I can do. You know, I feel like I'm very powerless in that area and that can increase our sense of stress. Sometimes even in that middle layer, things like we might feel very powerless over work or um, our finances. Um, and even sometimes we might not feel a huge amount of power over our own thoughts and feelings. But what we're trying to look at today is to maybe to take a little bit more control over those kind of internal pieces to do some things on a daily basis that can help us you know uh, manage ourselves a little bit better help us you know feel a bit more in control and a bit more minded um, internally and then we can look at ways to maybe try and tackle those other levels when all of these stresses are going on and we could do a whole other webinar for you know a day-long webinar on on stressors um but it's, you know, there's a lot, even this kind of shows up, there's a lot that can be happening for us um, at any given moment. So it's important to think about what is actually happening inside of us, what's our body doing when we're subjected to these stressors on a day-to-day -day basis. So this um, kind of diagram, or it's a very, very basic diagram of the, the brain, um, it's kind of in, it's 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 there to kind of highlight maybe what happens to the brain uh, when we encounter stress. So when we maybe feel very stressed, anxious, angry, um, we have different parts of the brain that all look after different different functions. So in this diagram, we're focusing on two of the kind of main areas. The very old part, which is the feel there, that's our amygdala and limbic system. So that looks after all of our basic survival functions and it looks after our emotions. The newer part, the front bit here, is called the prefrontal cortex, and it has think written on it there because it's involved with our more logical and rational uh, functions. So when we're kind of thinking clearly, thinking logically, it's probably that newer part, the prefrontal cortex, at work. But the 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 amygdala, that that old part of the brain and the limbic system, what happens with them is they control a function called the fight, flight, or freeze. So when we encounter something that's quite stressful or anxiety provoking, it releases chemicals called cortisol and adrenaline into our body. And they you know, do a lot of things, but including making our heart beat faster, maybe making our breathing shallower and faster. Um, and this was all very helpful back in hunter-gatherer days when we had to outrun a predator. So this is involved in sensing threat and making the body react in a particular way. I suppose, thankfully, we're not running from predators and, you know, uh, you know, big animals on a day to day basis. Um, but we're still picking up threat all the time. It might be social threat like um, maybe, you know, a, a, a bad, you know, bad comment from our boss or an argument we just had with our teenager before we left the house. And it can actually make the brain respond in a similar way to if we were, you know, trying to outrun a tiger. So we get all of these kind of chemicals released and we can feel sometimes very panicky or shaky. But also what happens in the brain is we get a kind of an emotional hijack. So that prefrontal cortex, the bit that's involved with logical thinking, that goes offline a little bit. So what we might notice in real life is that we become a little bit more irritable or a little bit more snappy and we're not really thinking that logically. So it's important to recognize that we'll catch ourselves if we can when we're in that space and try and maybe take a little bit of time away 
take a few deep breaths, get the kind of blood oxygen. We'll see the little arrow that says blood oxygen because actually deep breathing can really help bring everything back down and get that thinking part back online. So we don't end up saying something we regret, which keeps the cycle kind of going with maybe feelings of guilt and things like that. The other thing to recognize is that when we encounter very strong emotions, we usually have, the way we respond can usually be categorized into one of these three systems. So this is kind of at the center of, of an approach we call compassion focused therapy. Um, Paul Gilbert will be one of the, the key kind of thinkers in that area. Um, and what it looks at is that when we feel, you know, a very strong emotion, we might have different ways of responding. So if we act in a way that's maybe a little bit snappy or irritable, or maybe we're trying to distract um, or avoid um, you know, the, the strong emotions, we're probably operating out of a threat system. If we find ourselves in a more kind of incentive or drive um, and goal focused manner, we're probably in the drive system. So that could look at, look like us anything from us going for a run, it could be organizing the kitchen drawer, or it could be just scrolling on social media because it actually offers a lot of the same thing. We're seeking something. And then for some of us, we might find ourselves um, maybe finding a way to calm ourselves down, maybe engaging in some kind of breathing or mindfulness, or even actually reaching out to loved ones, you know, to, to connect with people, to feel kind of soothed in that way. And the important thing to recognize is we're we, we do all of these things to various degrees. So we're all doing all of these things, usually kind of unconsciously. So again, you know, I notice that if I'm feeling very stressed, if I find myself, you know, 10 episodes into some show on Netflix, I might be in the threat system a little bit, trying to distract from what I'm worried about. And there's no problem with that. It's not about saying one is, is bad and one is good, but it's important to maybe recognize that there's other ways of managing those kind of strong emotions. So I might want to think a little bit, you know, differently. Maybe actually it'd be good to press pause for a bit and lift the phone to a friend or, um, you know, do some breathing exercises or maybe even just, you know, try to achieve something small that I've been trying to avoid and they can all, they can all help. Can I just jump in for a sec, Connor? And yeah, um, so there's another um, model that we, we like to think a lot about, I suppose, a jigsaw with, with young people where we might think about how the different situations in our lives have led us to respond in particular ways that at that moment in time might be highly adaptive and functional. So they get us through that situation, but then kind of further on down the line, we continue using that particular coping style or strategy. And then without thinking about it, maybe it becomes unhealthy or unhelpful or dysfunctional over time. Um, now there's some, some things which will remain helpful and will remain adaptive, but it's worth sometimes just thinking about how do I respond or react in certain situations and is that still helpful to me? Yeah, so again, I think it's it is it's that tuning into where we kind of go to a lot and, and asking that question, as all I've said, like, is this helpful for me? Is the way I'm responding this way? Is it creating more difficulties down the line or is it actually, is it adaptive? Plus, bring in a bit, bit more psychology to kind of explain what might happen when we're, we, you know, when we're feeling a lot of stress and when we're juggling a lot of things. Um, we talk about the exhaustion funnel, which is an idea developed by Mary Asberg in Stockholm, and it kind of explains. It, it talks about um, what happens when, you know, a lot of stressful things are happening at the time and how, you know, things might start to deteriorate a little bit. So at the top of the funnel here, we see a kind of a balanced life. It's represented by a balanced life, maybe with a lot of different types of activities, things that kind of nourish us and things that we have to do. So a nice balance of the things that we enjoy doing and the things that we have to do. So up here, we might see kind of work, family commitments, but we might also see kind of exercise and uh, meeting up with friends and maybe, you know, learning and, and doing things that we enjoy to do. And down the bottom of the funnel here, we see exhaustion. So the width of the funnel, as I said, is the kind of the amount of things in our lives. So the more kind of different and varied things, you know, the more balance we might feel we have. And that's all well and good. But what happens when we get very, very busy? So as things begin to get busier, we can often drop certain activities from our life. And that's represented by going further down the funnel. So we might have a deadline and work. So we work that little bit later, maybe sacrificing going to the gym. 
we have that extra cup of coffee and the Mars bar to keep us going um, instead of the kind of the exercise. However, over the course of a few days, this change can cause us to sleep a bit worse. Our energy isn't as good as normal and that cup of coffee that was a kind of a treat at 11 o'clock is now changed into a lifesaver. The pressure is still on though and things aren't looking good. So we're staying a little bit later and work and maybe rather than going home and cooking a home cooked dinner, we, we plunk down at 10 o'clock in front of a frozen dinner. We might find that we've less time to spend with family um, and we might start to develop feelings of guilt in relation to that. And things might feel like they're piling up a little bit. Over time, physical symptoms like aches and pains and emotions such as guilt might start to feel a little bit, kind of might, might start coming up for us and start to feel a little bit overwhelming. And we might find that even the things that we enjoy doing, things like meeting with friends, start to feel a bit more like a chore. So if we continue to go the, down this funnel, we might end up feeling that the life that we once enjoyed starts to feel very joyless and starts to feel like a kind of a daily grind. And this can lead to exhaustion. And I suppose when we, we present the exhaustion funnel quite regularly, and we've been doing it for a while now, and Jigsaw is part of another self-care uh, workshop that we do, but it's really got me thinking as I was, as I was looking at it again, that actually this year in particular, um, you know, it's 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 particularly kind of different for this exhaustion funnel because we're not starting, even with the best of intentions, we're not starting at the top. I suppose the global pandemic and the lockdowns and things that we've all been experienced have meant that our lives are a little out of balance anyway. So a lot of the things we might have enjoyed doing, you know, pre, you know, March, like maybe we were doing evening classes or going to the gym or doing five aside or just meeting up with friends we're maybe less able to do at times, particularly when, when we're in lockdown at the moment. So we have to recognize that we might already this year be a little bit further into the funnel and we might have to work that little bit harder to maybe supplement some of the things that brought balance to our life. Um, and maybe if we, if we can't get to the gym, maybe putting on the wet gear and, and getting out for a walk, even, even on a rainy evening, or if we enjoy doing an art class, that we might take that time anyway and kind of do some some drawing or do something that kind of makes us something that adds a bit of difference to maybe just work at home. I'm going to hand you over to Olive to, to kind of look at maybe some of the things we might be able to do if we find ourselves heading down this fall. Yeah, as Connor said, there is no um, one way which self-care kind of um, is right for, for everyone. Everyone's got their own way of doing this. Um, so it's, it's not a chemical equation. There is no right answer. Um, and at the moment, like Connor said, you know, we all feel it. We even feel it in our, in our work. Um, we have, we've all got this additional level of stress. It just feels like it's bringing the baseline levels up just a little bit for people, maybe just a, a little bit less tolerant, a little bit less patient and a little bit less energy to give. Um, we're also living in a time and an era of rapid change where uncertainty seems ever present, um, whether it's uncertainty related to COVID or political situations. Um, and on managing uncertainty as humans is something that we've always found challenging. Um, it can be exciting, but a certain amount of uncertainty is okay. But when it's constant, it means that we've no predictability, we've no kind of safety, um, even psychologically to, to look forward to. So we're trying to build in certainty into our lives by maybe developing routines that sustain and support us. Um, like Connor said, it might be adapting that routine slightly in the current situation, but it's trying somehow to, to be flexible and to adopt what you know works for you and, and bring that into your life, particularly at this time of year. So this is like the perfect storm <laughs> during lockdown, winter, um, with all the other things that are going on in the moment where we're just feeling maybe a bit more depleted in winter anyway where the the natural kind of cycle of of life and of of the seasons is this, this is a time of of um maybe hibernation and then regeneration in spring and um, so for some people that hibernation and that kind of taking a, a slowdown and easing back for winter is is perfect for them totally fine and then for others they really miss the light and they have to find ways to build that into what they're they're doing in their daily life. Um, I think it's sometimes helpful to look at what is happening in nature and, and during winter, just what messages it gives our body 
um, being part of nature to, to try and um, to slow down. And you really notice that when you go and live in another country where they don't have the same types of seasons as us. Um, and it can feel like you might be out of kilter a bit when you're trying to, trying to, I suppose, take a step back during winter. Um, so just maybe encouraging you right now to take a moment with yourself um, just checking in and just start to notice what it's like, um, what's going on in your body or what's going on in your mind when I, when I talk about winter and how maybe that season affects you. What it might mean for you for looking after yourself and for seeking connections or support being with others at this time. We might look at some strategies then, um, such as this one. Um, so it talks about seven, seven elements of self-care and some of these will be quite familiar, um, engaging act in activities that promote a sense of well-being. So as Connor said, like going for a run, playing a board game with your, your family, um, having a Zoom quiz, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and then there's being aware of our own stressors, so our own triggers. And, and while we now know what Connor was talking about, kind of that, that funnel and what happens when we get kind of our, our thinking hijacked by our emotional brain, um, that will be different triggers for different people. So trying to bring those into your awareness and observing, is it, you know, small things like when people... Um, perhaps leave the, the dishes undone that set you off? Or is it something bigger, like when you don't feel acknowledged by others? Um, and just paying attention to those and how they're living in your life um, during this winter. And then we left this in because it will apply to some people and, and won't to others, but perhaps something to be aware of. And that's supervision. Um, we are very fortunate in our work to have supervision, um, a space in which to, to discuss our, our work and how that impacts on us and how we impact on our work. Um, and a lot of organizations that do um, people work, I suppose, or in the caring professions will have that. And some won't. Um, and in those instances, it can be helpful to have perhaps um, a peer or a colleague at work or, or even those in other organizations and particularly if you work on your own to seek out others who might might share that realm with you. Um, I suppose as well, we're just really conscious that for some people they're not, they don't have their work at the moment. And, and that can be a huge loss and um, a sense of purpose and meaning that that is is currently missing. And so it might be a helpful time to connect with others who who are experiencing that or who will remind you about your work and reignite um, what it is about your work that you enjoy doing and perhaps being able to, to talk about that, if not being able to engage in it at the moment. Um, boundaries is something that we talk about a lot, I suppose, in parenting and in life and, and maintaining kind of an awareness of ourselves and, and others and trying to keep those, um, those as separate as we can. Um, I'm really conscious of being the parent of a one-year-old and how sometimes that can come really close where my awareness of my child and I, you know, I feel like I know what he thinks or he feels. And I, I suppose I don't, but I imagine that I do sometimes. Um, so those kind of boundaries can be helpful to just observe um, between ourselves and other people, but also the boundaries we place around our time um, and how we give to others and how we give to ourselves. We'll come on to look at that a little bit more in a minute. Um, again, going back to peer support, so that doesn't necessarily have to be um, work friends or colleagues or, or people who share areas of interest, um, but peers as well. So friends, obviously friends and um, those who, who know, who are part of your tribe, perhaps, um, who know who you are, who understand you, who get you, um, and, and looking to them for, for sharing issues and perhaps looking for some solutions as well, or just to be heard. Um, and then there's making space for reflection. Winter is a lovely time for this, um, but as well, I would just say perhaps not to spend all your time in reflection um, and, and perhaps looking to, to some of the activities. So trying to keep some kind of a measure of balance between these. Um, 
because of getting our bodies moving and keeping kind of motivated, I suppose, is really important as well throughout winter. We have to keep going as parents and as people um, for others too. Um, and sometimes reflection can, um, can lead to new insights, I suppose, or awarenesses of, of who we are or how we're living our lives and what we want. And one thing I actually really enjoyed about the first lockdown was that time to to notice kind of what were my priorities and to to think again about how I was living my life and and perhaps the things I was spending time on that weren't sustaining me or nourishing me and and being able to legitimately cut those out um I suppose when we moved back out of lockdown perhaps things speeded up again for people and some of those things came back in, maybe uninvited or perhaps just out of obligation. And, and, and it might be worth thinking kind of what's my lockdown kind of um, wish like, or what do I, what do I remember about that that actually I really valued and thinking about how you might bring that back into to your life. Um, and then there's a huge skill of self-care and, and those, um, perhaps of, of living as humans is asking for support from others. You know, we're an interdependent species and we cannot live on our own. And so we'll speak to young people all the time about reaching out to others, perhaps to a one good adult, to yourselves, um, to other adults who, who are caring or concerned about them and, and talking about what's going on. For them. So trying to reach out for support. Sometimes if people know you well enough, you don't actually have to say what's going on. It can just be to sit down for a cup of tea or whatever it is that you feel supported by. Um, different For different people, that would be different. So it moves us on to the five a day for, for mental health, which ICSA talks about a lot, although we don't um, own it. <laughs> um, it's a pretty old concept. And I suppose five a day, because if we have the five a day, you know, the fruit and veg, um to sustain our physical well-being so this is about our kind of mental well-being um, so the first one of those is about connecting so we've just been talking about about that about asking for support or connecting with peers with colleagues with family with other people who who um who know you and who can help you look after yourself um then there's the being active. So that part of getting kind of our adrenaline going, getting the good, feel good hormones moving in our bodies, um, which it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It doesn't have to be running a marathon. It can be like Connor said, going for a walk. Um, and then is taking notice. So again, that's kind of going back to reflection, I suppose, or observing what's going on, but not necessarily within ourselves, or perhaps outside of ourselves as well. So in our surroundings, um, winter is a great time for that, where things begin to change and you can really see the, the change of the season. Um, or just taking notice of something small that perhaps you drive past every day or walk past um, somehow seems different um, when you just take a minute to, to be mindful of what's going on. Keep learning is an aspiration I think a lot of people have um, and a lot of people perhaps went into overdrive on in lockdown as well. Um, I, I know I had uh, great ideas about what I'd be able to do and then I had to pair it right back. But I think it is, it is helpful to keep our, our minds engaging with things that we're interested in um, and to I suppose it helps our it helps us it helps our memory and it helps keep that alive um and it helps take us out of ourselves um and then the last one is to give now as parents i know that's probably i'm going to put that at the bottom of the list because i'm imagining that everybody's doing a lot of that already um but perhaps there are other ways to do it that's actually you know very nourishing so you know we give a lot to our families i imagine but what about giving to our communities? And it's taking us out of ourselves and connecting us with other people, getting us active, maybe even keeping learning. And it can really connect us to a lot of different things. Um, so volunteering, for example, taking part in that committee um, and maybe getting involved in yeah, your local community activities around you. Um, so those are the five a day. And so I guess what I wanted you to do is perhaps take a minute um, 
this is what our typical kind of pie chart looks like. Um, like I said, you know, at least half is, is going to be spent on giving, I imagine. Um, and then there's the other ones. And it's not that this is out of balance. This might be perfectly in balance for, for some, some of us. But we might want to look at the areas that we spend a lot of time in and think about, well, do I really want to be balancing it in this way? Could I think about spending less time on, on giving to others and more time on taking notice or being active? Um, so it's just about considering what is balance for you. Um, so the questions that Connor just flashed up there, we might um, flash those up again. And this is just an opportunity for you to, to think again about um, each of these areas and what would your pie chart look like? So in connecting, what helps you to uh, grow healthy connections with people in your life? In act, being active, which ways of being active do you enjoy in taking notice? What do you notice about where you are and how you feel perhaps right now? What have you learned or tried out for yourself for the first time recently? It doesn't have to be a master's or a PhD, just can be anything. Um, my mum started to learn the tin whistle recently. She's 73 and um, I'm not looking forward to hearing it, to be honest, but <laughs> I'm very impressed that she has picked it up again. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, she can't garden anymore, so she's, she's gone a different direction. Um, and then in giving, what have you done recently to support someone else's happiness or to help other people out? So just taking a minute, perhaps even thinking about that pie chart. Nobody else can see it. You could draw it if you wanted to. And just thinking, what portion do I spend in each of these areas? So I'd like to take one of the areas and give us an opportunity in taking notice to do a grounding technique that we'll sometimes run through with young people. Um, so again, this is just an opportunity for you to engage in something different. You might do this all already, but um, perhaps just to, to clear your mind and connecting your feet to the ground wherever you're sitting um, and perhaps follow the instructions through as I read them out. So this is a five, four, three, two, one grounding technique. So acknowledge five things you can see around you and state what you see. So none of us can hear you, you can say that out loud if you like. Five things you can see around you. And then four things you can touch around you. So state the four things you can feel. And then acknowledging three things you can hear. So not your thoughts, but something outside of you, perhaps in the room or outside of the room that you're in. Then acknowledging two things that you can smell. So these ones get a bit trickier as we go on, so we ask for less of them. The two things you can smell, whether that's dinner, I don't know, the page that you're writing on, or your cup of tea, whatever it is. And then acknowledging one thing that you can taste. Not always pleasant. But it's not about that, it's not about judging, just whatever it is that you can taste. So in this grounding technique, we're trying to stay present. Um, and I hope that you can notice that perhaps you feel more grounded, more connected to what's going on outside of you and around you. Perhaps your breathing is slower, your heart rate is slower, 
Um, so we will also do this with young people quite a lot and ask them to do that when they're feeling very stressed. So when they're feeling perhaps down the bottom of that funnel or, or when, yeah, when life stresses tend to be taking over. Just to bring thinking back online again. And the last practical thing that we wanted to, to touch on, I'm aware of time, is a gratitude journal. So rather than ask you to do this right now, we're just going to, we share these slides with you anyway, but we're just going to talk you through, I suppose, what it involves. Um, I'm not suggesting that people aren't grateful for their you know, circumstances or their lives, people in them at all. Um, it can help, particularly when times are tough at the moment and in winter, um, we as humans get very stuck in kind of um, appraising negative and we can really narrow our focus to kind of what's going wrong. Um, I suppose it's a protective strategy. However, it does mean that we are sometimes missing what's going well or, or what's good in our lives. Um, so some research has been done on this. Um, and people suggest that doing it once or twice a week, even just writing down a sentence or a word, can be from the absolute mundane to, I don't know, um, my car worked this morning, <laughs> to, I don't know, something timeless or, you know, something about a person or a situation or something that really surprised you. Um, perhaps somebody, you know, made you a cup of tea out of the blue this morning or asked you how you were. Um, so we're really trying to focus here on experiences rather than on material objects or things. Um, so rather than go through the motions, I guess we're, we're looking at really look, you know, what we are grateful for and, and feeling the emotion of happiness when we're thinking about that thing. Um, going for depth over breadth, so rather than a hundred things that come into your mind, perhaps thinking and, and really deeply about one or two things that really have stood out for you. So getting personal, and this really involves kind of being, el elaborating on kind of specific details of things that are beneficial or, or that you're grateful for. And um, so rather than being kind of superficial, focus on people that are meaningful to you on um, situations for which, you know, you feel really blessed or are um, glad about. So trying to particularly record things that are, um, I suppose, um, you can, I suppose, talk about things that are um, surprises more than, than things that are maybe everyday things. Sometimes they can elicit much, much stronger uh, responses. Uh, and sometimes a question that it's helpful to ask ourselves is like, what would it be like if we didn't have this thing in our life? So that's what the sub subtraction rather than addition is like, what would it be like if um, we didn't have, I don't know, the, the place that we live in, for example, or the community that we're connected to. Um, and then the last one, um, after savouring surprises, is not to overdo it as well. Um, so sometimes um, we can get really into being grateful and expressing gratitude, um, but it can have a, a dwindling effect. So, you know, rather than doing it um, perhaps two times a day, really just doing it once or twice a week is enough. Researchers found that um, that was the most effective thing to do. Um, and to do it for about six weeks boosted happiness, it improved people's sleep, um, reduced illness symptoms and people were more contented with life and um, so it's just a habit that people might like to get into and it's not to discount the things that aren't going well and aren't positive but it's about being also grateful for the things that are good in our lives and um, so we just thought we'd share that we also sometimes ask young people to do that um, I just wanted to, to thank you all for attending. We've definitely spent a lot of time talking and Catherine signing. Um, so we really wanted to kind of hand over to you for questions. Um, just to, I suppose, remind everyone that if we don't get your question today, then we will um, look at them on our jigsaw.ie website as frequently asked questions if they haven't already been addressed through other webinars. The next webinar is on Monday the 7th of December and it's dealing with family conflict 
Um, and just before you go, please do fill out the survey um, that you get sent. Um, so thanks very much for your attention. Um, I have a question in front of me. Um, so I'm gonna, gonna read this out. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. So I have tried most of what you are saying and although it does help, I find I'm worn down as I can't seem to get help with my problem, which is my teenage daughter who has totally isolated herself for a boy. She won't accept she needs help and I have tried and have spoken to a lovely man at Jigsaw. Great. <laughs> Myself, I don't deal with winter well, and now I have this on top of COVID, and I feel like I've hit a wall. How can I deal with this? So it sounds like a questioner is right down the bottom of that funnel um, and mm. feeling like resources are unavailable. Um, Connor, have you had a minute to think about that? Yeah, I suppose I, I really kind of, it's one of those ones I think of sometimes the maybe the sense of control um, and sometimes we might feel that we really want to um, fix the situation, particularly for, for those we care most about in our lives, like the young people who are, you know, our sons or our daughters. And sometimes we can't, there's no simple, simple fix to it. Um, and sometimes we have to be there for the ups and downs, but that can take a real toll. So again, I, I really kind of, what really resonated with me with what you said, Olive, was that it seems like the, the, the parent is really, you know, they're almost the last part of the equation there. So I think it's maybe flipping that a little bit at times and saying, actually, how do I resource myself? Is it okay that I recognize all of these things are happening and that they're really challenging and that I might feel quite helpless in relation to them? And what do I need to resource myself? Um, because obviously there are there can be things we can we can try and ways we can support young people, you know. There's lots we can do in terms of trying to create space and and trying to listen and trying to allow them to come to the kind of solution. Um, and all of these things we can really try and tease out again, you know, uh, maybe in a little bit more detail around your daughter through one of our jigsaw services for this evening to really look at what do you need um, in terms of resources, what do you need to feel supported. Who in your life and in your network could could be that listening ear for you and um, who could really help kind of maybe put things in perspective and, and, and to offer you those supports. I think it's really challenging when things are beyond our control and you know people will come to help when they acknowledge it for themselves um, and that can be very um, difficult to, to watch and be part of and to, to try and support somebody through as well. Um, I suppose what I'm what I'm wondering is about yeah, the help help that you might be able to avail of, but also um, there might be something you know occurring in, in your daughter's life where she may have people around her who might be supporting her um, and you know maybe helping her to to guide her through this. I suppose one of the things about Jigsaw is it's it's voluntary and that feels really important to us um, that people are there and ready to engage with the help when we're there and ready to give it to them. Um, because oftentimes people don't see things in the same way and whilst, whilst you might see currently the situation and, and what's occurring from your perspective is, is, an, is an issue, it can be very difficult when another person's perspective isn't shared. Um, and so perhaps it goes back to being able to, to access other parents or, or support for yourself um, to, to help you through that situation. And I'm sorry to hear you're worn down. I hope that even though you seem to be aware of these strategies, that you're able to, to take a minute to, to connect with what it is that, that does work for you. And, and even if that's doing something this evening for, for yourself, I hope that you, you have some, some time to be able to do that. We have another question come through there, Olive. Um, so, excellent tools and presentation. Thank you very much. Um, what is the best way to connect with a teenager through COVID if you are living apart? Thank you. Yeah, that's a 
That's a tough one. Um, and I suppose sometimes people, we, we hear a lot from parents that teenagers can sometimes be challenging to connect with at, at the best of times, but I suppose where we're living separately um, and maybe not able to, you know, even actually go and visit with the with the restrictions, that presents a real challenge. Um, I don't know, Olive, what are your thoughts? I was just, I was wondering how the young person themselves might like to be connected with. And so some young people, you know, very happy to be online and to, to see people over Zoom or Skype or whatever platform they're working from. Um, and then others, you know, possibly text is an easier is an easier way or email. Um, yeah, or even even the phone. And I know for some young people, you know, we've gotten less and less familiar with using phones and speaking on phones. And, and that can be pretty excruciating at the best of times for for some young people. Um, but there might be there might be kind of a mix of different things that works as well for that young person. Um, and hopefully after the next stage, there, there might be at least a means to seeing somebody, even if it's outside for a period of time. Um, I suppose it comes it comes to what works for, for them. Really. See someone writing here, writing letters has helped. So mm. actually a really lovely way to connect. And I think probably one that might be a little new for a lot of teenagers, they mightn't be expecting it, but um, I definitely think could be could be something very novel and something also very tangible, something that um, I don't know, there's something nice even about getting a letter or a postcard. It, it feels like somebody's really taking the time to sit down and think about you. And again, you mightn't get the immediate feedback or, you know, your your teenager might say it's a little bit weird at first, but it might be one of those ones that they remember 20 years down the line that when they were separated from, um, you know, from, from one of their one good adults that they received this kind of letter through the post and it meant an awful lot. So that's a, a really lovely suggestion someone's put in there. That's really cool. I know some young people who carry around letters with them that have been sent to them that people wouldn't know that. So even when you don't know that it's meaningful or photographs or whatever it might be that yeah people people can really connect with those. Um, I have another question Connor shall I call it? Yeah please. Um, again thanks um, first webinar you're welcome to the to the asker. Um, us too, obviously. So got some good tips. I'm glad about that. Um, level five living in 5K is hard to find things to fill your funnel. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, and I, I sometimes, yeah, I wonder how how much more creativity we have within us to, to draw and to try and, you know, um, reinvent things or... Um, restory them to ourselves but I suppose the endeavor of, of doing it is, is important um, and there's no specific question in there and I guess everyone's 5k is different so it's very difficult for me to imagine what it is that is or isn't within your 5k and um, I hope that others within your 5k are aware that it might be um, hard to find things to do and that you know there's some way of of connecting and suggesting those things to each other um, i think yeah. the other thing that's really stood out i think about that i think it, i i completely agree i think it's it's getting difficult to think of creative things to do um to supplement some of the things we really love to do in the winter months are much harder as well i mean like i mentioned throwing on the, the the rain gear or the wet gear and going out for a walk but the reality of it is that that's not going to feel like the right thing to do sometimes i suppose we sometimes if we can't supplement the, the breath you know if we can't fill in the blanks it might be also about maybe stopping the the the, the roll down the funnel as well where we can so what i've kind of noticed is that particularly when there's less things going on in our life, less commitments, less maybe balance, less variety, we can tend to focus in on things that we maybe feel we have a little bit more control over, things that are there. So it might be work, you know, so we might find that we're spending a lot more time in work, not necessarily even because we need to, but because we can, 
um, or we might find we're spending, you know, just a lot more time watching TV or a lot more time doing one kind of our two activities. So it might just be enough, just maybe step back from doing that, you know, to set those boundaries like Olive spoke in terms of different things in our life. So even if you have nothing to do when you go home, it might still be a really good idea to make sure the laptop goes off at half five or maybe switch the TV off if you've been watching it for, you know, the last four hours and just sit, even if it's a bit boring or listen to a podcast or doing something a little bit different but if we can't supplement um the breadth of activities even trying to notice if we're doing too much of of something and also being really compassionate with ourselves it's a lot of it's out of our control at the moment so if we do find you know we're you know we're not getting it right if there's if there is a right kind of just be easy on ourselves about that as well I have um, I have one here, Connor. From uh, looks like the mother of a sixteen-year-old daughter, um, refusing to go to school due to low self-confidence, and is now isolating from friends and family. Mum is feeling very guilty that she has not been able to get her to go to school and that she can't seem to lighten the load mm -hmm. and she's asking how do i manage this feeling of guilt okay that's a difficult one and and, and school refusal is a really it's a it's a really difficult um thing because it's laden with a lot of values as well you know we get a lot of maybe feelings of, of guilt or or whatever as parents that we should be able to get them to school and we know because we we you know, when we sit with a young person who's gotten to a point with their mental health where they don't feel able to engage with school or friends, we realize it's very complex. It's not one simple fix. It's usually a lot of different things that have been going on under the surface for a while. And, you know, what I'd say is maybe to get in touch with maybe the free phone or one of our local jigsaw services, and we might be able to talk about if there's a, some support that might be really useful for your daughter. But in terms of the feelings of guilt that you're experiencing, I suppose it's my perspective would be to remind yourself that it's not it's not an easy situation. It's a complex situation. It's not, um, you know, it's very easy for people to come along and say, well, you just you just make them go to school. But when you're faced with a very distressed 16 year old um, who's really overwhelmed by the idea of it, it's very hard to. To push you know it's very hard to make somebody do something um but when then maybe they're they've missed another day of school that feeling of guilt increases and again what we can find is that those feelings add more stress to the whole situation so again it's maybe around kind of giving ourselves permission to you know that it's not perfect at the moment the situation is not perfect but we've done the best or we're doing the best with what we have at the moment and um, we might run aground a little bit we might be a bit stuck we might need a bit of support that might come in the form of people in our informal network that might be friends or family or people who may be gone through the situation who can lend us a kind of an impartial ear or a listening ear or it might be help from the school it might be about reaching out to the school and saying well what what can we put in place or it might be reaching out to a mental health support like jigsaw and um, to see if there's any advice they can give around it but in terms of feeling guilty the fact that you've shown up here this evening um, and you're asking this question and you're looking for that kind of support really and it shows that you're caring a lot and you're you're trying to, to make the situation put make the situation better but it's not an easy one and it, it might be a simple fix. I don't know, if you've... Yeah, I agree. I was thinking about um, the other mother of a daughter who's in a in a difficult situation at the moment and how it's very hard to watch your child go through something very tough and feel like your hands are tied and that it's out of your control. And I suppose, you know, we would encourage people to, to continue doing what they're doing is being consistent and loving and supportive and listening and continue to encourage and perhaps challenge your child as well. And um, by challenge, I don't mean, you know, force out the door. I mean, you know, questioning like um, perhaps supportively the decisions that they that they are making. 
um, and not all of the time. And then also focusing on things that are good, and um, so that this her, you know, your daughter's whole life, or and the other the other young um, woman's young life, don't become all about this situation. And um, that there are other parts to them as well that that might be easier to connect with at the moment, um, but perhaps are becoming overlooked because of the presenting kind of um, maybe problematic situations. Mm -hmm. I have another um, question here, Olive. Um, with five steps, the take notice part is always difficult, and what you notice around is stressful in itself. How can I reframe this or try to look at this differently? That's a really good one. And I think probably one that a lot of people can, can resonate with or can, can relate to. Yeah, I, I don't have a perfect answer to this because we're all subject to these same conditions. Um, and I wonder if it's sometimes being able to accept that some of the situations that we're noticing are not acceptable or okay at the moment um, and to notice how we feel and to sit with that and all the more difficult emotions anger guilt sadness um, disgust despair and um, they're all useful communications and whilst we don't want to become overwhelmed by them sometimes when we sit and notice them and how where they're kind of resonating or living in our in our body we are able to bring our breath to them and they will pass and that's not to say yeah i suppose it's not to discount that they're difficult and sitting with harder emotions is is really hard um and then perhaps it's looking for opportunities as well so sometimes there can be um you know two sides to any coin um, so some things that might appear difficult might present again in another in another light mm. and it's very hard to see that when the stress or the amygdala kind of threat response is taking over the kind of thinking part um, but when we sit back and perhaps can and you know accept the emotion is there and and allow for it to to pass and then something might change in, in terms of how we see it I think you even use the word yourself um is it to to re reconsider how something or re reframe reframe i think that's a lovely way to and it's not to reframe to ignore but it's to reframe to i suppose to be able to continue doing and, and to continue being and um, connie you might have another way you're looking at that yeah it's um I suppose another thing that kind of struck me is that sometimes in our in our local communities it can be hard to to find beauty, do you know, that kind of way. Um, and I think certain you know certain areas are you know very beautiful and lovely, and then others you know we might be looking at kind of grey streets and that mightn't feel that appealing or that beautiful, but we might need to kind of look around a little harder, do you know. And I think sometimes. Like again, I notice when I walk through the city, sometimes you can notice parts that are maybe quite covered in litter or there's maybe a lot of loudness or noise or cars and it doesn't feel like a picturesque kind of um, mountain view by any means. But usually if you look around or look up, you might be able to notice something that brings a bit of beauty, that there's always something there. Um, I know all of spoke you know, about that idea about even sometimes stressful experiences. That's not to diminish them, um, but sometimes where we're when we can tune in a little bit, we might notice that there is that little bit of hope within them, or that there is that little lesson um, within them that might give us strength. Maybe if not now, but maybe in the future, and it can make sometimes very difficult um, things a little easier to manage. And sometimes that little spark of beauty can make even um, you know the less um, appealing surroundings kind of a little bit more manageable and yeah um, and look up if you're ever actually walking around I think a local town or area particularly if you're in Dublin I realize I never look up until I'm in holidays um, and it's a really nice thing to do uh, you notice things you've never noticed before and it can give a real sense of um, lightness it's something uh, that's quite nice so that's just an aside but there we are yeah. Okay. 
So I don't have any more questions, Connor, and I can see that we're we're five minutes past nine. So okay, anything said us? We cut off. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Just to thank everyone for for coming again, and um, we we will probably think about those questions afterwards. And if there's anything else that comes to our mind, we'll put it up on the on the website um, yeah. at the Ask Jigsaw um, section. Our website's a huge resource for parents, for young people, for professionals. Um, not just webinars, but there are videos and and blogs and lots of other things on there that can be useful. So, um, if we haven't answered your question today. Um, please do get in touch with us that way. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Good night.